is the Big Bend country of the Columbia River. Vast, rugged, remote. Almost as remote today as when Canada's early fur traders used this route to open up the fur trade in the Oregon country 160 years ago. Columbia is the fourth largest river system in North America. Its drainage basin covers a quarter of a million square miles between the Continental Divide and the coastal ranges. The Columbia is an international river. From its headwater source in Columbia Lake, the main stem of the river follows a twisting course for 480 miles through British Columbia, then for another 740 miles in the United States to the Pacific Ocean at Astoria, Oregon. South of the international border, it gathers waters from seven American states. To the north, its Canadian headwaters drain 39,500 square miles of southeastern British Columbia. The Columbia is a mountain river. Its first beginnings are in the melting snow and ice of a thousand mountain peaks that ring its basin. On these high slopes is set the pattern of spring runoff for the lower river. In a normal year, the snows melt gradually under the summer sun. But a combination of deep snow, a late spring, and abnormal heat can send this water cascading to the valleys below. Between the snowfields and the main river, there are a few natural storage basins to slow the runoff, and the river volume varies widely with the season. For example, at Revelstoke, the greatest recorded flow is 99 times the minimum. The Columbia and its major Canadian tributary, the Kootenay, have a long history of damaging floods. In the Great Flood of 1894, an estimated 600,000 cubic feet per second passed across the border south of Trail, causing untold damage even at that early date. Today, because of the economic development of the area, such a flood would be a hundred times more disastrous. Farther south in the American section of the basin, repeated floods have done tremendous damage to one of the most heavily industrialized areas of the Pacific Northwest. Yet the key to this industrial growth has been the electric energy generated by this self-same river. Grand Coulee Dam was the first of a series of massive hydroelectric installations on the Lower Columbia. Since the end of World War II, practically every available site has been developed from the Canadian border to tidewater. Today, these great generating plants are capable of producing 10 million kilowatts of continuous power. But without regulation of the river, their annual output is about half their design capacity, and some plants have yet to be completed. Spilled water is wasted power. At flood levels, there is too much water for the generators. It pours over the spillways, wasting down to the sea. At low river stages, there is not enough water to drive all the generators, so power output is curtailed. Lack of storage capacity was limiting power production on the lower Columbia. Canadian and American engineers agreed that the answer to the problem lay in the Columbia Basin in Canada. So the American authorities opened formal negotiations with the government of Canada and the province of British Columbia shortly after World War II 
to develop upstream storage areas in Canada. But the international negotiations took time, and in Canada, the Columbia continued to flow unharnessed as it had for thousands of years. Meanwhile, the economy of British Columbia was accelerating. With excellent road, rail and air transportation, deep sea ports and tremendous natural resources, the province developed at an unprecedented rate. In 15 years, the population nearly doubled with demands for new housing, increased public services and a steadily increasing use of electrical energy. The British Columbia Hydro and Power Authority, responsible for the production and distribution of electrical energy in the greater part of the province, faced a continuing challenge in meeting these demands. It had been established that 7 million kilowatts of new power would be needed by 1985. It had also been established that British Columbia had up to 100 million kilowatts of undeveloped power in her rivers, but time was a factor. The Columbia was still a subject of negotiation, while the Peace River in northern British Columbia was free of complications. So the Hydro Authority launched the Peace Project to meet the immediate needs for power and provide time necessary to reach a satisfactory agreement on the Columbia. This gigantic project, where men and machines are literally moving a mountain into a valley, will produce its first power in 1968 to serve its rightful owners, the people of British Columbia. The Peace Project thus became stage one in the multi-river development policy of the British Columbia government. But even its tremendous potential of 2.3 million kilowatts was expected to be absorbed by 1976. The peace project had filled the gap and provided time to complete successful negotiations on the future of the Columbia. On September 16, 1964, at the Peace Arch on the international border at Blaine, Washington, the leaders of Canada and the United States of America met with the Premier of British Columbia for formal ratification of the Columbia River Treaty. This symbolic meeting, climaxing more than two decades of discussion on the subject of the Great River, signified full agreement between two nations and was another historic day in the annals of Canadian-American friendship. Each government leader signed with the conviction that an equitable arrangement had been achieved. The United States backed their action with a payment of $273 million. The destiny of the Columbia was settled. In broad terms, the Canadians agreed to regulate the upstream water of the river, and on their part, the Americans agreed to pay for this regulating service. In detail, the agreement called for the building of three dams in Canada, with the first step being the construction of the Duncan Project. An earth-filled structure, 120 feet high, with a crest length of 2,600 feet. It will release storage water through a concrete spillway on the east bank, and across on the west bank through gates installed in the lower end of the diversion tunnels. The Duncan Dam will create a 28-mile-long reservoir and be in service by April 1968. In anticipation of formal ratification, Canadians had already started to fulfill their side of the bargain.
preliminary access and clearing contractors were preparing the Duncan site for building the first treaty dam. Clearing was carried out to facilitate a quick start by contractors interested in tendering on the big job of placing the fill. By 1969, a second and much larger project will be completed at the lower end of the Arrow Lakes, some 30 miles north of the international boundary. The Arrow Dam will be an earth fill and concrete structure, 170 feet high, with a crest length of 2,800 feet. Waters of the storage reservoir will be controlled by gates and spillways, while a navigation lock will provide passage for river traffic. The dam will raise the level of the Arrow Lakes, creating a flood control and storage reservoir 145 miles long. At the Arrow site, contractors were gouging into the overburden in August 1964, preparing for the start of that project. On one side of the lake, a highway was being relocated. Across the lake, other contractors were involved with the relocation of three and a half miles of railway. The dam area is waking to the roar of diesel engines, and the new rails are starting their gradual rise to carry freight cars beyond the flood line. Here on the lakeshore, a new pump house is being erected to serve the Selgar Mill with clear upstream water for the duration of the construction period. Out in the lake, trucking contractors are inching a causeway to facilitate the building of a coffer dam. These contracts are each covered by a no-lockout, no-strike agreement, with all trade and craft unions expected to take part in the projects. This master labor agreement, patterned after one already in full effect on the peace project, is an example of labor management cooperation and will ensure uninterrupted continuity of construction to meet the firm schedules of the treaty obligations. The third and largest of the treaty projects will be built 90 miles north of Revelstoke in the wilderness country of the Big Bend. Here the mica dam will impound 12 million acre feet of water, of which 7 million is a treaty commitment, and the additional 5 million to produce electrical energy at the site. The dam will be 640 feet high, with a crest length of 2,500 feet. The reservoir will extend up the Canoe River Valley and 85 miles south along the Rocky Mountain Trench. Here, clearings for the construction camps predict the arrival of the main workforce. This is the actual site of Mica Dam with the massive bluff that will serve as the right abutment of the structure. Preliminary work is concerned with exploration of the rock structure and the drilling of hundreds of test holes. With the completion of the MICA project, treaty storage in Canada will total 15 and a half million acre feet to be released downstream as required. This storage will regulate the river flow and result in increased power production in the American plants downstream. The United States agreed that British Columbia is entitled to one half this increase in power generation and further agreed to purchase British Columbia's share of this power for 30 years in advance for 273.8 millions of Canadian dollars. But there is more to downstream benefits than increased generating efficiency. There are also payments due to Canada for flood control. 
for the Duncan project, a cash payment of 11,988,000 on completion. For the Arrow project, 56,268,000 on completion. For the MICA project, 1,296,000 on completion. For a total of $69,552,000 in flood control payments. Here then is a grand total of 344.3 millions of dollars. This, with the accumulated interest, will pay the capital costs of the three treaty dams and half the cost of installing generators at MICA and set the stage for further development of low-cost power on the Columbia in Canada. We turn now to another element of the treaty, the Kootenai River, scenic and powerful tributary of the Columbia. It rises amid the glaciers of the Rocky Mountains, then flows south, missing Columbia Lake, the source of the main river, by a scant mile at Canal Flats. It then continues southward in the opposite direction to the Columbia and crosses the international border into Montana and for 150 miles courses west, then northward, back into Canada to rest for a time in the splendor of Kootenai Lake. The city of Nelson, situated on the western spur of the lake, overlooks the narrowing channel from which the Kootenai waters plunge through a canyon and a series of spectacular power dams on their way to join the Columbia a few miles above the city of Trail. It is here that Canadians have a regulation problem of their own. Waters wasting over the spillways of five dams between the city of Nelson and the village of Brilliant. Under the terms of the treaty, the United States may exercise a five-year option to build a dam at Libby in Montana and utilize about 40 miles of the upper Kootenai Valley in Canada as part of the reservoir. This dam, when constructed, will alleviate the threat of flooding in the rich farmlands at Preston, aid in the control of the level of the Kootenai Lake, and assure Canadians of a future annual energy benefit of more than 200,000 kilowatt years on this major tributary of the Columbia. Those communities in closest proximity to the Treaty Dam projects, such as Nelson, Trail, Castlegar and Revelstoke, will realize the first tangible benefits from the construction program. The city of Nelson is a popular tourist and commercial center of the West Kootenays. Nelson will be the distribution center for construction of the Duncan Dam and will benefit greatly from the stimulus of the construction program. Trail on the banks of the Columbia, the prospering city that grew around the consolidated mining and smelting metallurgical complex will feel the surge of business that comes with the dam project. But of more importance will be the blessings of flood control this city will enjoy when the treaty projects are completed. Castlegar is the natural hub of communications for the building of the Arrow Dam to be located just upstream from Selgar Limited, the largest forest products mill in the interior of the province. Revelstoke II will benefit from the Columbia Agreement. In its beautiful setting, this awakening tourist center could become the equal of any European mountain resort. With superb east-west rail and highway links and the prospect of major construction activity on the Columbia, the horizons of this historic railway center are a challenge to the imagination and determination of its people. But the economic impact of the Columbia Agreement will not be confined to the project areas. 
It will, with other exciting developments, bring prosperity to all communities of southern British Columbia. The impact of 344 millions of dollars will radiate across the economy of the province and the nation. For money once released increases trade as it changes hands from day to day. It is a conservative estimate that money placed in circulation under the Columbia Agreement will generate three billions of dollars worth of trade within the province. But commissioning of this mammoth project is not entirely a matter of dams and dollars or acre feet of storage water. It imposes a responsibility for the welfare of people living in the project areas. The first consideration is for those whose homes or businesses or communities will be affected by the rising waters. In the main, these are located along the shores of the Arrow Lakes. Here, several small communities will face the problems of relocation and numerous farms and ranches will eventually be vacated. Here at Burton, for example, is an area which has survived the ravages of changing years. It now faces the prospect of relocation. For some, the move will be welcome. For others, it will mean severing ties with an area which to them is home. At Nakusp, the 40-foot rise of the waters will displace several commercial enterprises. No one fixed policy of compensation could be devised to meet the varying attitudes and circumstances of these deserving people. Each case must be dealt with individually, and the government of British Columbia firmly supports the intent of the Hydro Authority to negotiate with each claimant in fairness, in sympathy, and in full recognition of the sacrifices that these individuals will be called upon to make in the interests of the people of British Columbia. We now return to the mica site, key to the ultimate full development of the river. By 1973, this last of the treaty dams will be completed and paid for in full under the terms of the Columbia Agreement and British Columbians will then be able to enjoy the first dividends of power from the mica generating plant. If the present load growth continues, the full output of the mica plant will be required by 1976 and will add 1,800,000 kilowatts to British Columbia's power resources at an on-site cost of less than one and a half mills per kilowatt hour. This will be delivered by a province-wide extra high voltage transmission system linking the generating sites to the centers of population. Then will the fullest benefits of the Columbia Agreement come to the fore. As the need justifies thereafter, the Hydro Authority will embark on a further construction program to develop more than two million additional kilowatts at other downstream sites made practical by storage at MICA beginning with a million kilowatt project at Downey, and after that, 630,000 kilowatts at Revelstoke Canyon. Farther south, just below the location of the Arrow Dam, Murphy Creek will produce an additional 300,000 kilowatts. On the lower Kootenay, plant expansions and the Kootenay Canal plant will account for another 340,000 kilowatts. And Seven Mile, close to the border, will provide a still further 350,000 kilowatts. Thus, the mica plant, together with these future developments downstream, will result in a total of 4,438,000 kilowatts of new power from the Columbia Basin in Canada. Fully developed, the Columbia will fulfill its role in the multi-river plan and assure continuing low-cost electric power to meet the needs of the people of British Columbia.